Auburn to the alley in Chinatown, called Croft's Alley, uh, where I made a video several years ago that's on YouTube. Um, now I'm looking to see what the changes are. It's as if we've come upon a whole new exhibition of uh, contemporary graffiti, and some of the things that were, were attracted our attention last time are still here. Now the Rauschenberg sculptures are um, ornamented, and uh, a real bird is walking along the edge of the roof near the uh, lovely little drawing of the, the bird surrounded by uh, scads and scads of building supplies, all the um, uh, nesting materials that could ever wish for. On this wall, several years ago, when I had my first visit to this alley uh, in Melbourne, uh, there was a large portrait head of a young man wearing glasses on this wall. It could have been mistaken for a painting by Chuck Close. It was very realistic. Uh, even the reflections in the eyeglasses were beautifully done. It was a very well-crafted piece of painting. It's been erased, and this new work has been put here which is interesting in its own way. I think the um, severed heads of the animals and the hands separated from the body are uh, an interesting exploration, as are all the uh, calligraphy elements. Some of them look almost Chinese, others are obviously in English, some of them are block letters, some of them are very highly stylized letters. Um, it's wonderful that all these changes can take place. Here we are in this special alcove that I liken to um, a, 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 a nice age shaman's place of discourse in the caves in the Pyrenees. The monsters so, still here, um, sharp and lively as ever with a few changes and additions. Um, I feel like I've come home. I'm glad to see that the monster remains and that um, I can be here to greet it. Start. Here's a nice example of a, some really splashy, highly layered graffiti. Um, it's obvious that uh, it was done at different times uh, with different colors, with partial erasures, um, with the spray can being allowed to uh, blur out parts but just be misty in others. A uh, lot of nice gesture painting is here. Uh, this is an artwork and it's right beside the wonderful monster that I love so much. I'm delighted to have found these again. Last time I talked about this as a found object uh, that I embedded in my series of paintings called Pandora's Box. Now someone else has found them and transformed them into little robot creatures. Uh, monochromatic as before, but with a new, whole new personality. Um, also, the uh, things along the side, all the numbers and letters, give it another feeling. I'll go over here and look at um, this doorway, which is incredible. Look how full of stuff this is. How can anybody be that obsessed? Van Gogh could be that obsessed. Jackson Pollock could be that obsessed. So why shouldn't the kids who live in Melbourne enjoy the same kind of obsession? But the layers and layers of all the different uh, things in there makes a lace-like tracery that's rich um, in, in uh, intricate details. It's like the best Belgian lace. Incredibly intricate and delightful. Have an interesting example 
of layering. This head is obviously um, underneath several layers of, uh, uh, it's glazed by layers of colored paint uh, sprayed over it. Uh, another thing that's very nice is this um, grid with the bricks over it, how that purple paint transforms into something else. And here we have a very sharp, recently painted um, illustration. And here we have all these whole series of wonderful benches. I could see someone taking the whole series and putting them up on a gallery wall in New York, side by side. This group of four panels by Joseph Boyce is housed at the Tate Modern in London. Museums around the world feel, feel proud to own and display these and others like them as evidence of his thought. They resulted, as he was discussing his theories and ideas, diagramming and charting them as he talked. His ideas were about social and political systems and how they transformed energy in its circulation. He hoped that others understood his theories uh, and understanding them w would make positive changes occur in society. The ownership and exhibition of his work by museums is a highly ironic situation. Boys and his fellow conceptual artists believed that art shouldn't be segregated from other life activities. The merit of art should not depend on institutional approval. The whole procedure of enclosing artworks in frames and subjecting them to special lighting on a museum's walls and then charging a fee to view them is limiting and elitist. In an effort to avoid having art presented as an object or commodity, they tried to introduce new venues and new ways of looking at art. Conceptualists have emphasized ideas rather than style and technique. Installation artists have chosen to create settings unlike those of zoo-like museum chambers and walls. Boyce's work is often political and involves commentary on social issues. The entire practice of doing graffiti may be seen as a form of social protest in that it proclaims by virtue of its public unofficial location that art doesn't require institutional approval or locations to announce and endorse its presence. Now, I just got through saying how conceptual artists emphasized ideas rather than technique. They were making a point that expertly executed drawing or sculpture without ideas is just a mechanical exercise. I happen to think that the best art harmonizes technique and ideas and transcends both. Ideas are often generated from imaginative use of materials. Technique can adapt and adapt and enhance the expression of ideas. For example, this section of wall has visual effects which arise directly from the use of spray paint. Droplets, splashes, and misty gradients not easily achieved by brush or roller are part of the repertoire of effects natural to a spray medium. On this leg of my journey through Melbourne, I'm looking at calligraphy, uh, especially calligraphy that compares in an interesting way to that of the ancient Maya, the hieroglyphics, and uh, Chinese calligraphy and Celtic calligraphy. I think they're examples of uh, graffiti artwork that relate to all those three. Uh, a wonderful coincidence happened here. I see a, uh, uh, a stencil work that says Pancho the Great. Uh, in the tradition of Mayan um, hieroglyphics, there are a lot of glyphs that are, um, they're called emblem glyphs, and they are the names of the ancient rulers of uh, Yucatan and parts of uh, Belize and Mexico. And they have names like Moon Jaguar and Sky Watcher, Sky Witness, um, names that have to do with the animal, jungle animals and the geography of the place and ast astronomy. So this seemed especially appropriate to, to look at. 
um, the other factor in them is that they are uh, kind of self-contained forms. Well, I see better examples of that elsewhere. Um, maybe this would be like a glyph. The, the glyphs are stacked. Here are some examples of Mayan hieroglyphics. We can notice the similarity of drawing to some cont contemporary graffiti. Theirs was an extremely literate and learned civilization. Their history, beliefs, and astronomical system were recorded in screen-folded books called codices, of which only four remain. All others were destroyed by the Spanish conquistadors and priests who censored them by burning them. It wasn't as easy to burn stone, so examples remained carved on walls of ruins and monumental stelae. These two are the Dresden Codex and the Paris Codex, named after the cities in which they are now kept. The combination of black and white letters with colorful Im imagery is another similarity we can see in Melbourne's graffiti. Okay, uh, here's another uh, uh, piece of art that looks like a Mayan hieroglyphic. Uh, see how these forms bulge out and double back on each other, making a uh, continuous unit? That's an attribute of the way Mayan hieroglyphics are drawn. Another style calligraphy that relates to a venerated tradition of Celtic calligraphy uh, that was originally done to um, illustrate or ornament uh, biblical passages. Um, this one um, relates in that it's um, intricate and interwoven and twists and turns very like the uh, braided, beautifully intricate forms that you will see in Celtic manuscripts, especially the Book of Kells, which is in uh, Tr Trinity College, in a special museum in Dublin. Um, so uh, this, this is the beginning of an examination that we'll see more of this kind of thing, and I think they're pretty amazing. This illumination of a biblical image has stylistic similarities with the large wall graffiti we just saw. The spiky, thorny, serpentine coils of flowering vines relate also to the cobblestone lanes festooned with roses and geraniums in this Melbourne neighborhood. This garden-like setting is happily interspersed with colorful letters of graffiti. This is a sheltered, relaxed setting in which to stroll and contemplate the visual language available to be read and admired in graffiti works. There are some aspects of Chinese calligraphy that need to be mentioned in connection with Melbourne graffiti. Perhaps the world's oldest known writing is Chinese. It originated as divination marks on tortoise shells. These are estimated to be 8,600 years, years old. As time went by, these symbols became codified and became part of the written language from the Shang Dynasty onwards, about 1600 to 1046 BC. Drawn with brush strokes, order and control became important. Abstract qualities, time, rhythm, and shifts in space were also criteria for expertise. Graffiti practitioners have similar procedural rules as can be seen on many how-to sites online. The result is a streamlined and contained configuration having speed and sharp edges, sometimes resembling a motorcycle. The visual value system endorses a built contained quality. Chinese characters are also contained and built into a grouping that stresses grace and fluidity. 
The most highly prized examples deliberately deviate from the rules and strive to invoke elemental power in a form of metaphoric brushstrokes and placement. These occur by virtue of the property of a, flexi a flexible brush to reflect impulsiveness and restraint, elegance and rebellion. Usage of a spray can, as used in graffiti, has a similar potential. In China, calligraphy has a more prominent position than painting and sculpture because of its ability to invoke nature's process. The force of a boulder falling down a hill, the fleeting patterns left on the water of a pond as geese swim by, frantic beasts stampeding in terror, a startled snake slinking away in fright, or a drop of dew glistening in a dangling needle. Throughout the history of human life on Earth, people have made marks in their habitat on every surface available. Cave walls, boulders, wood, cloth, paper made with bark and papyrus, animal hides, bronze, pottery, and now, as in New York, Melbourne, and San Francisco, brick, concrete, and glass, metal garage doors, the sides of train cars, and even plastic garbage bins. These are important records of human feeling, thought, and activity. In our 21st century world, we are surrounded by icons, logos, and signage. In public shopping areas, the tags of corporations announce their venues and wares in letters writ large, sometimes reaching hundreds of feet into the commons of the sky. Our visual space is cluttered and dominated by their choice of harsh, demanding colors and severe letter edges dictating what we should eat and otherwise consume. Their perversive presence and repetitive insistence that we notice the advertised products and services is anything but pleasing or aesthetic or polite. It is visual pollution. We are given no choice about it. The big M and KFC tags are everywhere and citizen protest made through legal government channels is contemptuously cast aside due to the financial power of these entities. It's reminiscent of both George Orwell and H.G. Wells' novels that the niche found by young artists in our era is in back alleys and transportation warehouse areas. It's deliciously ironic that some of the places previously ignored and designated for trash bins are overwhelmed with the embroidery and the commentary of energetic artwork by youth and have become the worry and concern for authorities bent on squelching what they fear is out of their control. Isn't it the corporations or their Wall Street masters that are out of control?